<laughs> and Sheila, before, before you read, could you tell us why you've chosen this particular passage? Okay, well, I'm going to read from uh, chapter four, Grandfather Speaks in a, in a Strange Language. Mm -hmm. And there's so many reasons why I chose this, this piece. Um, it's, it's Sylvester out on the land with his grandfather. And so it's very true to the time he would have been out on the land, he would have had that relationship with his grandfather. Uh, you know, I think of my own relationship with my grandparents and then seeing, seeing them with my, with my grandchildren, my children. Um, it also kind of sets up in order for the book to be believable. We had to really hone in on why, and I guess dispel the myth. Uh, that the Biathic and the Mi'kmaq did actually get along and cohabitated peacefully and were not sworn mortal enemies, which is the colonial way of thinking. So in order to make it believable that Sylvester would be um, perhaps uh, protecting uh, his, uh, his brothers and sisters, the Biathic, uh, we had to give um, some background uh, so that the reader would say, yes, of course and it would all become clear. So I'm going to read chapter four, Grandfather Speaks in a Strange Language, just the first couple of pages. Something awakened Sulawe from a sound sleep. The fire in his grandfather's wigwam had burned down to a few embers. Sulawe whispered to his grandfather and asked him if he was awake, but he did not reply. It was then that Sulaway heard his grandfather talking to someone very softly. He rubbed his eyes to clear them of sleep so that he would see who had come to visit while he was sleeping. His grandfather was sitting by the fire with his back to Sulaway, and he could not see the face of his grandfather's friend. There was something strange about the conversation. The person who spoke to grandfather did so in a different language, yet grandfather seemed to understand what was being said. Sulaway wondered if he should put some more wood on the fire, but there seemed to be something stopping him from doing so. Sulaway tried to understand what was being said as he snuggled down in his bed of halibu skin. As he looked out through the smoke hole, he could see it was still dark. Who could this person be that grandfather was speaking with? He must have fallen asleep then because when he opened his eyes again, a new day had come and grandfather was moving around outside. Come and eat, grandfather said, as he moved the fire coals. You must eat fast, because today we move to the sacred mountain. Who did you speak with last night, Sulawe asked. Grandfather looked at him with surprise. Did you hear, he asked. Then he turned toward the mountain, and even though Sulawe saw his lips move, no words could be heard. Grandfather must be praying, he thought to himself. But grandfather had such a troubled look on his face that Sulaway did not think that this could be so. What is troubling you, grandfather, he asked. When the time is right, we will talk, grandfather replied. <laughs> so there is a little taste of my Indian. Thank you very much, Sheila O'Neill, for reading that. And thank you so much, Chief Joe. Thank you. I just, I enjoyed speaking with you both so much today. And for aspiring writers out there, do you two have a piece of advice that you could give them? Determination, patience, and patience, and more patience. Mm. Yeah. And for me, if you have a story that you love, tell it. Because if you love it, your readers will love it. Mm. Oh, I like that. I like both of those pieces of advice. That's wonderful. <laughs> so again, thank you to both of you. Appreciate your time and your storytelling. And for all our viewers out there, I will put links down below in the description box so you can purchase a copy of My Indian. It's a fantastic read and I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.